Thank you very much. Uh, well, this is exciting for us. Um, and as you can see from the title slide, uh, this is a work in progress. So uh, forgive us if it's not completely finished yet, but this uh, we wanted to start with a, the title of our new program at Stanford called the Stanford Balance Center, which is uh, the development of an interdisciplinary program. And the difference between multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary is that we talk to each other when we're inter. So. And one of our goals is to provide comprehensive evaluation and care for people with a balance disorder, and especially to reduce and or prevent falls in the community. So we've gathered for you here our interdisciplinary team, and I'd like to introduce them. And we're going to go sort of in reverse order of the table. So down at the end of the table is Dr. Gerald Popelka, who's a professor of otolaryngology and who's also the chief of audiology. And sitting beside him is Diane Pacholsky, who's a physical therapist specializing in neurorehabilitation and vestibular rehabilitation. And beside her is Gotham Telekuntlia, who is an audiologist and who does all the audiology and vestibular testing at Stanford. And then here, right to my right, is Ellen Corman, who's an occupational therapist who is the founder of a very special program at Stanford, probably a very unique program called Farewell to Falls, and she's going to talk to you about that. We have no disclosures. So just an overview of what we're going to do. About the 30 to 40 minutes is going to be a presentation. We're going to be talking to you. And at that time, we're going to overview, just give you an overview of balance and problems of balance. We're going to tell you sort of the history and how we've been developing this interdisciplinary program called the Stanford Balance Center. Through that, we're going to tell you how we think and how we're trying to evaluate a patient who has a balance disorder and how we're proposing to treat someone. We're going to tell you about the types of rehabilitation therapy that we can and will be doing, and home assessments, the Farewell to Falls program. And that's going to then be followed by a panel discussion. These are rough times. So. Uh, in the panel discussion, I know it's always very tempting, but just for the sake of the time that we have, please do not uh, ask us about your own particular situation. Just because it's very hard for us if we're not seeing you in a therapy type of situation to say anything. We certainly don't want to say the wrong thing. And don't ask us how to get a referral to the balance center. Because <laughs> I'll tell you right now, there are little, little pieces of paper that you should have got, um, which is really at the moment, we need you to be referred from your primary physician to the Department of Neurology at Stanford with a request for a Stanford Balance Center appointment. And what we did was we uh, put a whole bunch of Stanford Balance Center questionnaires. You don't have to fill them out, but if you or somebody you know wants to be evaluated at the Stanford Balance Center, this is something that we will need you to do before we see you, and we'll, we'll talk about that in the talk. So let's move to the presentation. So when we talk about falls, it's this strange sort of topic that everybody knows that it's one of the most problematic issues. Uh, but nobody really knows how many people fall and what we do about falling. And in a very large analysis that's, that was done by Gillespie and all through the Cochrane Review, from many, many published studies, it's apparent that at least 30% of people over the age of 65 fall every year, in the, generally in the community. Of people age 75 and older, over 50% of people who are institutionalized, that means may have been maybe in a nursing home, some care facility, they were put there because of falling. This is the scary statistic. Only 20% of people who are falling actually get medical attention at the moment or at the time this was written. So what are the causes in general of falling? Well, people who have problems with their balance and their walking may fall. People who can't see very well may fall. And people who have dementia or cognitive impairment may fall. This is, this is all evidence-based uh, uh, results. So this is not just pie in the sky. This is what's coming out of a large review of the literature. 
And in that large review, looking at evidence-based medicine, there were clearly statistically significant interventions that have been proven to reduce falls. And we were very uh, interested in this and used this very much as a basis for our program. One of them is muscle strengthening techniques, customized balance retraining, home modifications, and customized medical and or surgical treatment. So what is balance? Well, balance is this word. I mean, you all think you know what balance is. But what is balance? Well, if we can give you somewhat of a definition, we would call it a multi-system. So it uses a lot of different parts of us. Dynamic means it has to change all the time. Function that keeps our body o upright over our base of support. And the, the lingo of the base of support for me currently are my feet. So it's whatever part of you is basically in contact with the ground or a support surface. So if you're standing on a ladder trying to fix something, your feet are contacting the ladder and the ladder's contacting the floor. Okay. So static balance is when the ground or the ladder or whatever is not moving, it's still. Dynamic balance keeps your body appropriately oriented during voluntary movement. So if you get up out of that chair, your center of gravity has to change from being seated to standing on your feet. So you have to shift how your body and brain are orienting your balance in order not to fall over. And that's a problem in some diseases like Parkinson's disease where the brain doesn't do that very well. <coughs> and over a changing base of support, i.e. sitting to standing, okay? And when the support surface changes. So a support surface changes means maybe you're taking a hike on a rocky trail and you're having to kind of move over rocks. Or if you're walking on sand, it's not really very, it moves underneath you. And some of you who may have balance problems or know people with balance problems, you know that that's a, that's a time they could fall. So how do we do this? How does our body do this? Well, luckily we all have bones, so we can stand upright. We don't just collapse like a jellyfish. We have, and this is something that really we'll talk about quite a lot, is we have this amazing sensory organization system. So we call organizational sensors those sensors that interact with the environment and us. So one very important one is something we call proprioception. So that's the feedback that we get through our legs and our body, through the muscles, sensing receptors in the muscles, the joints, the nerves, etc. Vision. Many of you know it's probably harder to balance with your eyes closed than with your eyes open. We all use vision to balance. And then our vestibular system, which is our system within our inner ear that helps orient the head on the body, the body over the ground, the eyes and the head, etc. And Dr. Papelka will talk more about that. And then we obviously have to coordinate the muscles of our body so that certain muscles are contracting. So right now I'm standing up, so what we call my extensor muscles are contracting, but my arm muscles don't really have to if I'm standing up, okay? So we've got this whole muscle adjustment situation where as we move, different muscles have to contract and release in order for us to move and balance. And our brain is very much involved in all of the above. So here's some examples of people who have highly trained static balance. So for instance, ballet dancers who are on point have a very small, what we call, base of support, the point shoe. Similarly, gymnasti gymnasts have to maybe balance on their hand on a balance beam. And somebody who's performing a hand, an arm pose in yoga is obviously balancing on their arms. And I think that's a really nice one to look at um, because what you can see is this person's body is really at a very odd angle. So the center of gravity has to be right over these hands. And look at this ballet dancer. She has to get the arm and the leg out perfectly straight so that she comes right over her leg here. Now, good examples of people who need really good dynamic balance are people who are going to be balancing themselves, especially themselves over a bicycle, over change, a changing base of support, so a rocky, rocky path. And here you can see a cyclist that has a very narrow and small connection with the ground. And it's moving all the time. And look at these soccer players who, again, are moving all the time. And look at this extremely up and coming soccer player. Personally related to me. Um, and so you can see that dynamic balance is extremely important. So, what happens when balance goes wrong? Well, we call that imbalance. 
One cause is dizziness. So how many of you, when you say, oh, I'm dizzy, you mean actually that the room is spinning? What most of you would probably feel that you feel lightheaded, right? So as physicians, we always have to ask you what you mean because there can be different causes for that. But at least 50% of people who complain of dizziness have some inner ear problem. Otologic means ear. And these are some of the causes, and you can read them. There are various diseases of the ear, which Dr. Papelka might talk more, more about. But basically, problems with the inner ear, sensing the vestibular nerve itself, and sometimes, obviously, structural lesions like tumors affecting that area. 5% of people complaining of dizziness, it's a neurological cause, such as stroke, seizures, etc. Now, people can have medical causes. So if they're lightheaded, it may be because their blood pressure isn't rising as they stand up. So they actually don't have enough blood flow going to their brain, and they faint, which is what syncope means. Or they may have a heart arrhythmia, which has the same effect. Some people, when they're very anxious, or what we call somatization, they have some reason that they feel that they're dizzy, but we can't actually find a physical cause, are called psychological. And there is another group that's actually a fairly large group, which obviously we haven't found out the real answer for, and we call them the multi-sensory disequilibrium disorders. And some of those we lump into those, the post-traumatic. So there are other reasons, as we said, why you might have imbalance, and those might be that you have actual problems with your balance system, which we call postural instability, or you may have problems with your walking. And obviously, the neurological disorders are far and above the, most of the causes for this, and you can read them up here. And these are the diseases that I deal with a lot as a movement disorders neurologist, where actually the brain is now involved, and the brains are normal mechanisms for doing all the things we talked about, adjusting your posture from sit to stand, moving over rocky surfaces, et cetera don't work as well. They, we can't integrate the sensory information very well. There are a lot of reasons here, but they're all neurological. If your muscles are not strong enough and you try to stand up, you might fall down because you're weak. And that's one cause not to forget. And that can come from problems with the muscles themselves or problems from the nerves that feed the muscles. Then sensory disturbances, as we talked about, if you can't sense where your feet are because you have a peripheral neuropathy, you are going to have problems with balance. And I can tell you that those will be especially severe when you close your eyes, because you will have been relying on your vision a lot. And when people close their eyes and start swaying a lot, we know in neurology that that's probably because they have a peripheral neuropathy. And then, as we said, if you have problems with your vision, or if your eyes are moving uncontrollably, you're going to have a lot of trouble with your balance. So with this background, and with the fact that the Cochrane Review told us that only 20% of people who, are fall, who fall are actually getting medical attention, we as a team looked into why these disorders are not being adequately treated. And basically, from our experience and from the literature, we felt that there was no standard comprehensive protocol to screen somebody with various types of balance disorders. What were the diagnostic tests that we as a team felt should be done in order to evaluate that person for all the causes that we discussed? There's also a problem in that there's been a lack of focus therapy. And there's a lot of sports medicine literature out right now that shows that if you are an athlete, you will become better in that sport if you do sport-related training. So golfers get a better swing if they practice their swing. Swimmers don't need as good a dynamic balance as a soccer player or a cyclist because they're in the water, right? So all of these things now are being shown in, in literature that you really need focused training. And what we're saying is we're now taking that to the disease state and saying you need focused retraining. How does a doctor refer somebody to get a uh, workout for a balance problem? That's also been a little haphazard. And as we said, the literature doesn't have very good evidence-based medicine of outcomes for the standard of care for somebody with a balance disorder. So we decided, why don't we take a sort of look at this? And if the overall goal is to reduce falling, we felt there was a need for an evidence-based um, fall assessment and intervention program. So if we take a fall as the event, what's the process? Well, from what we discovered, what we just discussed, somebody might need a neurological and a medical evaluation to look for things like, do they have a dementia? Is their thinking okay? 
Is their blood pressure OK? Are they somebody who might faint when they stand up? Do they have a, an arrhythmia? How's their vision? How's their muscle strength? How's their balance and their gait, their walking? They also need an otolaryngology evaluation, vestibular and audiology testing. How's that most, most important sense, orientational sense of ours, the vestibular system? How's it working? They need a rehabilitation evaluation. And very importantly, which is often missed out, they need a home assessment. What's going on at home? Are they more likely to fall at home than outside? And I can tell you for some people with Parkinson's disease who live in very cluttered houses, they fall at home, but they don't fall when they're out walking on the beach because they fall when they're in restricted environments. So very important is home assessment. From that, we hope that we would be able to design customized therapy for every individual. And we hope and we hypothesize that this would lead to a reduction in falls improvement in balance and walking, and hopefully an improvement in independence living so we could get that number down of people who were institutionalized due to falls. So the Stanford Balance Center was created in kind, and we felt that we wanted to be an interdisciplinary team serving a wide community, people who come through the emergency room, people who are actually in our inpatient, on our inpatient wards who get out of bed and fall, private physicians, people who uh, Ellen and her group see at home, who they think need the evaluation, outpatient clinics. And from, as I said, these various different input sites, they would be finding their way to some customized therapy. And along the way, people who are evaluated in the Stanford Balance Center may be seen by a wide variety of physicians, notably people in neurology, otolaryngology, rehabilitation, perhaps neurosurgery, perhaps ophthalmology if they have eye movement problems, perhaps sports medicine. We're trying to develop our own balance retraining center. It's not quite there yet, but we're moving towards it with our uh, vestibular and neuro rehabilitation through physical therapy. And from that, we then hope to have more community outreach with home-based programs and outcomes that we can then follow so that we can determine whether we're doing a good thing. And on for that, to be able to do that, we have now, thanks to Dr. Papalka, a really wonderful database that everybody is being fed into. And that's why you can see for your screening questionnaire, all of that data gets fed into the database. And we will and can follow this program and determine whether, in fact, we're meeting the needs that we want to meet. So just quickly, here's the process flow. Somebody who has dizziness, somebody who's falling, may come in through these various sites. And we thought, well, how are we going to get everybody so that we can start triaging them? So the first page of that questionnaire, we have screening questions. And this took a lot of discussion among the team as to what were the shortest but most powerful screening questions through which we could understand wh where you needed to go in your assessment. Well, the first one, of obviously, is do you have balance problems? If the answer is no, well, maybe this isn't the right place for you. And of that is, are you unsteady? Do you have lightheadedness when you stand up? Getting to the weakness issue, do you feel weak when you walk? And then, of course, getting to the falls, we wanted to know if you are actually falling, not due to tripping over your cat or something. And do you have any of the following problems? And this gets to the vestibular issue, dizziness with a sense of spinning, which we call vertigo, ringing in the ears, or fullness in the ears. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Papalka, who's going to tell you what we do as part of the evaluation on the side of otolaryngology. So thank you. So otolaryngology is the only discipline that nobody knows how to pronounce, including half of the people in the discipline, which is why ENT is used. So the official name is otolaryngology, but we send out letters, show up at the ENT department, and the patients come in looking for ENT, and it doesn't say ENT. Um, so um, we have a very special organ in our inner ear that helps keep us oriented. So this is a cross-section of the ear. This is where you're not supposed to put the Q-tips in our eardrum. And buried in our, deep in our head is our hearing mechanism. And right alongside of it is our vestibular mechanism. It's all part of the same organ. And one way to think of how this organ works is that it's like a carpenter's level. There are tubes with liquid in them. And as our head moves, the liquid moves, and it gives us a sense of where our head is in the environment, including 
when we get in a car and move forward or stop. So we have two of these. There, this is one on the right side, and we have a similar one on the other side. And um, that mechanism can have some diseases, but um, what gets complicated is the parts before this, our ears, earwax, simple things, also can contribute to this, and we need to separate all of those factors out to find out if it is, in fact, in the inner ear. An important aspect is uh, now imaging. So we take um, MRI images, and um, many people have already had those, and we now can see very much of the structures buried in our head to look for things like tumors and other things like that. So that might be part of the evaluation. Um, so in order to sort all of this out, we need to find out if there's a hearing problem. We need to find out if there's a vestibular problem, and those are often related. And we need to separate those factors out just to find out what we're talking about. So the first part is the standard hearing test. And the hearing test involves presenting tones. Raise your hand when you hear the beep. You've probably had all of those. Presenting other sounds like um, speech, say the word go, say the word it. But we also do other kinds of measures with devices we put in our ear that apply pressure to give you the uh, sensation, you know what it's like going up and down an elevator, uh, because some of the problems that could be causing dizziness might be as simple as fluid in the middle ear, not the inner ear. And so we need to separate that out to make sure it's the correct thing is being treated. So that's the hearing part. If we now go to the vestibular part, which is part of the inner ear, we have other tests that we do specifically for that. So one of the things that is done is actual position changes. So we physically move the patient in particular positions to see if that uh, aggravates uh, the problem. That, partic that particular kind of testing moves both vestibular systems at the same time because they're bolted to the same head. So when I move this one, uh, if I move my head this way, I'm moving this vestibular system and this vestibular system. And we have to see if we can separate those out because some of the diseases only occur on one side, not both sides. Um, this is an important one. By applying air to the ear, on one side or water. We can change the temperature of that. That affects the fluid on that side alone and gives the sensation of being dizzy. And so when you come in for this kind of test, we're gonna make you dizzy, but that's the, that's the intent. But that is a way to activate one side without activating the other side. In fact, that's why you get dizzy. So we have tests where you're lying down and cold or warm air is put in to stimulate just one side, not the other. And that helps us separate out if it's one side or the other uh, compared to other uh, diseases. And the sensation of dizziness is often related to a mismatch between what you see and what you feel. So dizziness is often accompanied by eye movements. And so we want to look to see how your eyes move in relation to these uh, kinds of tests as well. Um, so that would be eye tracking. So this is the kind of to tones that are used for hearing testing. And that's to measure this part of the ear, that's the hearing part, which is right next to the vestibular part. And we get the uh, results and uh, plot them on a graph. We also try to activate this system with tones, but instead of having you raise your hand, we get the measures involuntary. So we actually want you asleep. And we get that information by using electrodes that we put on the head. They're very much like the standard EEG electrodes. So you go to sleep, the electrodes are on your head, we present sounds, and we detect the brain wave changes and that way we can get measures of your hearing system and your vestibular system without relying on you to raise your hand or give a voluntary response. 
Um, the next thing is, uh, since we're interested in eye movements, we want to track eye movements. And so we sit you down in a chair and put goggles on like this uh, young gentleman is wearing. And um, we have optical means of looking at your eye and as your eye moves, we can record that eye movement. In fact, it's very, very sensitive. We can get eye movements that you couldn't see normally. And it's very, very um, reliable and quantitative. So by using these goggles, we can measure your eye movements. If we now stimulate your vestibular system by moving your head or by using water, we can get these kinds of tracings that are here on the right-hand side, and they give us very precise information, not only about both sides, but each side independently. Okay, so that, the, the measurements are actually quite complicated. It takes a couple of hours to do all of the diagnostic tests, and we have to be very careful because many medications affect these measures, and so many times you have to go off medication just to do the, the diagnostic uh, test. Okay, so now I'm gonna turn it back over for the neurologic evaluation. So what do we do? Well, as I said, I think at the beginning, one of the very, very important things we do on the neurological side is examine you, take your history. So that helps us with how's your strength and your heart and all the other things we were talking about. But now we have some very clever ways to really look into that, those organizational sensors. The one we can't do is the vestibular system. So our colleagues in otolaryngology are doing that and doing it extremely well. And what we're doing here is we're now going to investigate how well is that sensory feedback system from your feet working and how well is your vision working to maintain an upright stance. And we, we figure that out by literally taking them away from you. So here's our fancy, we call it our balance machine, and it looks kind of big and fancy here because what we have is a what we call a visual surround. So the person stands in this little cubicle here so that their visual environment is just this multicolored surround. And if you look carefully, you can see that they're standing on something that looks um, like a gray square and those are called force plates and we can measure the forces exerted from their body through their feet and they're called the ground reaction forces and that gives us actual quantitative measurements of how much somebody's swaying as they either stand still with their eyes open we take away vision just by asking them to close their eyes we then trick their sensory system by actually having these force plates move. So whenever I sway slightly forwards, the force plate moves in the wrong direction. So if you think about it, when you sway forward, it feels as if the ground's coming up to meet you. Well, we make it go away. So that in fact, the angle between your foot and your leg stays about the same. And that minimizes that sensory feedback. And then we look at how well you do with that and whether that makes you sway a lot, which tells us that you've been relying on your proprioception a lot. And then the other thing we do, which is pretty tricky, is we make the visual surround go in the wrong direction. So when I sway towards you, you look like you're coming towards me. So we do the opposite. We make the visual surround go in the wrong direction. And this is actually sounds fairly easy, but what, it, what we're really doing is we're examining how well the brain can handle balance without the appropriate sensory information and with what we call incongruent or the wrong sensory information. And that gives us a lot of, of data as to how well your, your brain is dealing with, um, is able to maintain balance under altered sensory conditions. So that's really, really getting at your sensory organization, which is a key part of balance. The other thing we do, and this is a fairly busy slide, is we use the same force plate, but now we ask you to voluntarily move. So I don't know if any of you have seen experiments where you check how quickly somebody can move their arm with what we call a manipulandum, and you see reaction time and movement velocity. Well, we do exactly the same thing, but with your body. You're standing on the force plate, and we say, okay, when a target comes on, in front of you, say this one up here, 
You have to move as quickly as you can and as far as you can so that you move a representation of your body, which is a little icon, up to this target. And you go, go, like this. And we do it to all different directions. And we measure your reaction time, how quickly you can move your body, and very importantly, how far you get to what, where we would think you should be able to sway without taking a step. And that's called your limit of stability. And if your limit of stability is narrowed, meaning your body really can't handle too much sway, that's going to put you at risk for falling. If you add to that that you've got slow reaction time and your body moves slowly, that means the minute you get off your base of support or your limit of stability, you're not going to have the reaction time to bring you back up. So we get fairly good quantitative data of the sensory process of balance and what we call the motor process of balance. So I'm going to turn this over now to Diane to talk to you about vestibular and neurological rehabilitation. I'm a physical therapist, and um, I don't know if how many of you have ever had physical therapy. Can I see a raise? Yeah. I thought maybe. Well, vestibular rehabilitation is a specialized field, a specialized part of physical therapy. And in, I have to hit the right button here. Okay. Um, what we try to do as physical therapists in this field is address some very specific goals around improving balance, as you might imagine, uh, minimizing falls, as Dr. Bronte Stewart talked about the importance of that. We also look at trying to improve um, the symptoms of dizziness and vertigo that our clients present with. In addition, approve, try to improve the stability there uh, during walking and other daily activities, whether it's um, you know, picking objects up from the floor, being able to reach high shelves, walking on um, gravel. Um, what is it in their daily life that they're having problems with and try to improve their stability in those activities. And then the other piece of it that's very particular, I think, to vestibular rehabilitation is trying to decrease the dependence that a person may have on using their visual cues or holding their head really in one place, trying to maintain their balance with other systems that they need to free up so that they can interact with the world. Some people we can do that with and they can get better with that. Some people we have to teach them how to adapt. So we have different goals um, in vestibular therapy, I think a little bit more specific to the vestibular systems and the balance systems that the, the physicians have just talked about. Ah, sorry, I missed the last one. So also, um, we also look at improving coordination of eye, head, and body movements. So again, so that you're freed up to perform the daily activities that you need to perform in your life and not holding on um, with your head or your eyes or your hands for your stability. Okay. So when we first get a referral for vestibular rehabilitation, we'll, we have um, an assessment that we do. And we'll first look at joint mobility and range of motion. We'll also look at strength, uh, particularly um, core strength. And uh, that's very important because you need to have a um, stable core in, or in order to make the appropriate balance responses and use the appropriate balance strategies. We'll look at eye and head movements. Are the eyes moving um, with the head or are they moving independently of the head? Can you maintain your balance and, and turn your head? A lot of my clients turn to walk and talk, and then they lose their balance, right? Because they're holding on so much with their head and their eyes to maintain their stability. So we'll look at that. We'll also look at different balance tests on various surfaces, um, looking at foam, a very compliant surface versus a very stable surface, balance beam kinds of surfaces to um, really try to find where exactly this person is having their problems with balance. Um, in addition to the, in the assessment, we'll look at joint sensation. And we'll look at um, daily activities like gait. So I'd like to get to the meat of it, which is the exercises, which is basically what we do in physical therapy. 
Again, flexibility and strength are really critical. Um, some areas uh, in particular with this population, we look a lot at spinal extension. I always think of my mother told me to stand up straight. It's really important. It gets more important, right, as you, as you get older. Um, so spinal extension is very often something that we need to work on with our clients. Range of motion at the ankles, because you use sway at the ankles as a way to maintain your balance. Um, strength, again, core strength, hip strength, strength around the different anterior and posterior aspects of the ankle. Those are some of the really um, important areas that we'll tend to look at. There we go. Postural alignment, trunk stability, trunk extension, ankle range of motion. Okay, and strength around the hips and ankles. Another aspect that we'll look at is eye coordination. I talked a little bit about that. We'll look at how are the eyes tracking and moving on a target. So if, um, can I stabilize my head and move my eyes selectively? That's in all different directions. So that's one of the things that we'll look at. Can I hold my gaze? Can I look at something and turn my head without having to turn my whole body in order to look at something? So we'll look at eye coordination and we'll very particular um, to that I found in working with some of my patients that really like to use computer. We'll really look at um, complex scanning on a, a complex background. So can you pick out targets on a very complex background. Because a lot of people that have trouble um, looking at the computer and it's almost like the letters and the numbers are, are floating on the screen. And so we develop exercises to work on those kinds of skills. Okay, um, balance activities. There's a whole range of balance activities that <clears throat> we would tend to work, will work on, excuse me. <clears throat> And a lot of that has to do around varying positions of your base of support. Dr. Bronte Stewart talked about different aspects of base of support. I don't ever have anybody on point, but, you know, tandem, standing, you know, drunk driving test, um, single limb support. We look at all of those kinds of things. In addition, I might develop exercises using uh, various surfaces. So, as I said, solid versus maybe a foam um, surface which is more compliant, which you have to work a little bit harder and you have to really sense what's happening. You may do that with your eyes open, you may do that with your eyes closed, depending again on where your problem areas are after we've done the evaluation. We'll also sometimes, we're very lucky at Stanford, we have actually a, watt, a we in the department. And so some, we will, um, with some clients, use the Wii gaming system. There are a couple of um, uh, balance activities where you, you're standing on a, a tilt board and you have to sway to get the ball in the hole. And some of those activities work very well for, for some clients. So we're able to do that. And then daily life activities, which is the crux of it, because that's all of those pieces we have to put together so that whatever the daily life activities the person's having trouble with, we can help to improve. Um, turning, getting in and out of bed, from getting up and down from the chair, as Dr. Bronte Stewart mentioned, to walking, being able to walk and talk, walk and turn your head, walk on different surfaces, make quick turns, those kinds of things. Picking objects up and down from the floor and stair climbing. And stair climbing was actually an interesting one for me um, with some of the clients that I've worked with that have had some issues with uh, separating their eye movement um, from their balance. And um, being able to scan while you're walking down the stairs is a very difficult task for some of these clients. So the basic thing that um, we try to do with the rehabilitation program, I hope you can get an idea from this, is that Number one, designed by a therapist, whether a PT or an OT. And that you design it specific to the patient's challenges. So those problems, I can rattle off a list of exercises. Well, some of those balance exercises, if they're too general, aren't really going to address your problems. So trying to be very specific to what the problems are for the particular client. 
and then to practice those. And, and sometimes my, my clients feel a little bit dizzy. Sometimes they feel like the room's swaying, but what we're trying to do is work just at that place where you are having an issue so that you can retrain your balance system and make it better. So we're basically developing customized programs. And it's a home-based program. So I develop the program with the client, and they perform it two to three times a day. And then they usually will come back on a, on a weekly basis or so. And um, the exercises are updated, and we uh, increase the complexity of the exercises until they reach their optimal balance. So it, um, one of the wonderful things about the Balance Center is that it, we do have an interdisciplinary aspect to it. So um, I would like to now introduce, besides physical therapy, there's occupational therapy. And this is Ellen Corman who's going to talk about the Farewell and Falls program. Thank you. OK, I know we have probably so many questions for the panel. So I'm going to be very short. And to let you know that actually, I think in um, next month, I will be back at the, um, at the JCC doing a talk during the day. So if any of you are interested in more information about Farewell to Falls, do have another opportunity. What Farewell to Falls is a home-based program, and it's, it's set up for people who are 65 years and older, who um, are ambulatory and cognitively aware, and it's really multifaceted. When we talk about people who um, have stre um, strength issues or strength and balance problems, sometimes it's not because of a vestibular or an otolaryngology. See, I'm one of those ENT people needing to use those words. Um, but sometimes it's just because through between the aging process and our sedentary lifestyles, we get weaker. And sometimes it's just the need to be able to get stronger that will help us to be able to lift our feet higher and be able to use our core strength so that when we go to sometimes lose balance, all of us trip sometimes. But those who sometimes go to trip and have that inner strength can pull themselves back to center, and those who are not strong enough then don't have the ability to pull themselves back to center, and every trip turns into a fall. Farewell to Falls sends an occupational therapist out to your home, and what we do is look at the multifaceted risk factors for falling, and we look at those in terms of your home for safety. So what is in your environment right now that could contribute to a fall risk? You know, are there things that you could be tripping over? Um, you know, the, the one everybody always says to me is, oh, don't tell me to pick up my throw rug. Because um, everybody says it, and I don't want to do it. But I can tell you, anytime there's a surface difference in your environment, then in the days that you may be dragging a little bit, then you have the potential to find that little lip between the floor and something else, your toe catches on it, you go to sort of lose balance. Now, those who are strong enough, and you can say, but I've had it in my house for 50 years, and I've walked over it for 50 years. But if you are starting to get weaker, and you don't have the ability to win this next time your foot catches on it, to be able to pull yourself back to center, then when that foot catches on it, you fall over, and you fall down. So the, whatever we can do to minimize those chances of tripping and falling, the better chance that you, you'll have to be able to always stay upright. The same thing for things like the, um, the bathroom and looking at the grab bars and other things. So doing a home safety assessment and being able to make sure that your environment is as safe as it can be is really important because more than 50% of falls do happen in your own home. We look at medications. And the, um, our occupational therapist takes a list of it, and it's looked at by, by the, um, a pharmacist at Stanford. We know the data is very clear that four or more medications strongly contributes to fall risk. It's not only the number, but it's certainly the type and the amount and the combination. So it's important to take a look at that and be able to see whether there are changes that possibly can be made, either in the type of medication, the time you're taking it, the dosage, or other things. And then we do look at the strength and balance and try to be able to see whether there are, whether it's deconditioning that is your issue. And if so, is there 
exercises that you can do, even joining, encouraging to join local programs or doing home exercises. It may not take physical therapy, it may, but physical therapy is prescription based and usually short term in terms of actually one on one with a therapist. And as you age, you need to be moving all the time, all year long, year after year. So we need to be able to make sure that we're setting up a program that be able, that's something that's long standing so that you continue to stay strong. Because if you exercise today and then give it up tomorrow, in a couple months, what you had today isn't going to be there. So we want to make sure it's long term. So I'm going to close with that and just tell you that, that there's more information that the um, program Farewell to Falls is a free community service that Stanford offers. So if you do um, believe that, that um, there's brochures in the back and if you believe it's something that you're interested in and is a, would be appropriate for you, you can actually self-refer. Um, and so take a look at it and, and feel free to, to give us a call. And then I'm going to turn this back to you as, um, as our audience to be able to have an opportunity to ask anybody in the panel some of your questions. Can a GP assess the ear or it's beyond his capability, you need further skills? And can the average otolaryngologist do what you do or does it take a specialized person to do the testing you're doing? So the, the main problem is that the sources of the issue is very complicated. Some simple things the, can be done in a simple way. As it gets more complicated and uh, as uh, sometimes multiple diseases occur at the same time, it takes more uh, effort. One of the things that the Stanford Balance Center is doing is looking at all of those uh, together rather than one at a time, a GP or an ENT, and uh, to try to sort all of these out uh, ahead of time. The question was, um, what, what about, do you, it sounds like a very complicated evaluation and, and how much does it all cost? Actually, the first thing is I have no idea because we don't know that. Um, but with the questionnaire that you have that, we, that was handed out, we use that in order to do what we call triage you. And actually there were some slides that fell out in from sending this from one computer to the other, which showed you how we, how we use that questionnaire in order to triage you. So if you're somebody whom Ellen has referred to us because you're clearly deconditioned and weak, and you aren't telling us you have any balance or vertigo problems, we are probably going to send you probably through a neurological exam and then possibly to your medical physician if there's something wrong with your blood pressure or heart rhythm and then straight to therapy. However, if you're somebody who's endorsing balance problems and or vestibular problems, we will probably do some quantitative testing and that's a fairly important and new piece in the Stanford Balance Center that we hope is going to work towards standardizing the care of people or the evaluation of people with a balance disorder. Because it has been somewhat haphazard. And so we want to gather enough information to really understand people's balance. Now, all of the tests that we talked about here are, be, are paid for by insurance. So when, when we would, you know, and if you, if you don't get pre-authorized, then we will let you know and we won't do it. The Dr. Popelka said that, thank you, most uh, that he showed that in fact sometimes he uses imaging to look into the ear. What if you have something like a pacemaker? Is there some other test that you can use? So having a pacemaker or other kinds of devices, we also have cochlear implants, for instance, that, that can't be done. Um, so we do resort to other kinds of imaging like CAT scans that, uh, where it's, it's okay. Um, also for the future, um, those of us involved with device development are looking at new materials to make the future generations of these devices uh, compatible with the imaging systems. But we're aware of all of those and have to resort to alternative types of imaging and uh, if that's not possible, we have to rely on all of these other uh, diagnostic tests. 
the question is, can an inner ear problem cause lightheadedness? One of the biggest problems is that the sensation of dizziness or lightheadedness is very difficult for the patient to describe accurately. So we have to rely on the physiological measures uh, to, to do that. Um, but the inner ear can cause eye movements, which can cause dizziness, which can cause some of these sensations. Okay, not specifically lightheadedness itself. Because there's so much confusion with the word diz dizziness, whether it's vertigo or lightheadedness or weakness or what? Yeah, and there is a lot of confusion with all of these words, and one of our goals is to standardize some of these, uh, some of these measures. The question is, do we collaborate with other institutions? If you look around the country, um, there are very few balanced center programs. What happens is somebody has a symptom, is referred to a particular provider, that provider does that much and says, well, it's not in my area or it is in my area, and then nothing else is ever done for the rest of the system. Um, Probably the um, most prominent balance center uh, entity I know of is um, at uh, the, the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. But most of the other kinds of centers are only vestibular centers or movement disorder centers. They don't include uh, everything together. In terms of collaboration, we have everything at Stanford now for, for this. So there's no need to go to, uh, this is intermittent, isn't it? There's, it's okay? Um, there's no need to uh, go to any of the other disciplines. They're all part of the Balance Center already. Okay. One other word about that is, uh, again, it was, it was on one of the slides that fell off, is one of the things that, that we think uh, is really helpful is we have something called our Stanford Balance Center Interdisciplinary Re Review Board. I told you that at the beginning I kind of joked that the difference between inter and multi is that we talk to each other in inter. Well, that's true because really it is a huge problem. People can go to see the neurologist, the primary care physician, the therapist, the otolaryngologist, and they, they come out getting lots of different information. So what we do is we try to get everybody around the table to discuss the person. And that's why we talk about customized therapy. And we think that's a really important part of these programs. It's a very similar model to lots of different programs we have at Stanford. For some of you who know tumor review boards, in our movement disorders group, we have surgeries that we do and we have everybody around the table. And this is something that we have found has really improved care because then the person gets a, a, a view from an interdisciplinary team, and we've all talked to each other. It sounds really mundane, but it is a problem in medicine. So as far as collaborating with other groups, I think we all are, all are collaborating in some of the research that, that we do. This is fairly new, and we think that as time moves on, we're hoping that other centers are going to do something comprehensive like this. So the question is, if you, as the person with the balance disorder, are already in a system where you've seen various different specialists, subspecialists, therapists, would there be some pushback where they would not, the, the referring provider would not think that it was necessary for you to come to the balance center? And I am, imagine that could be true. Personally, um, we've had sort of the opposite actually go on is that even before we were even trying to publicize this, which we actually still are not trying to do, um, but uh, we would have even our neurosurgeons who we had no idea and knew we existed to sending somebody who maybe had some balance problems after a tumor resection, sent them straight to the balance center because the word got around that there was a, a sort of interdisciplinary way of looking at this. I really don't know on the outside, and uh, it might be a problem. Anybody else have any ideas? Um, just to give you an example of how the interdisciplinary uh, concept is so important, even in our own department, if you come in with symptoms, one provider gives you two questionnaires and you fill it out, and you go down the hall to a collaborator 
And they give you the same questionnaires to, to fill out. So we're trying to integrate all of that um, uh, as, a, as a whole. Um, I've had an occasion where uh, I've had a client come in for something else, uh, for physical therapy, and for another problem, and found that there have been issues that make me think this would be a very good client to, to make sure we cover all the bases and to get a neurology balance center referral um, so that we have the computerized um, postrography test. That's the platform test that Dr. Bronte Stewart. So we would really have a better feel of what are some, why is this person unstable? Why are they having problems falling? And I've had experience where I've then contacted say the primary care physician who ordered physical therapy um, and then discussed a bit of this is what I'm seeing, would you consider a referral to Neurology Balance Center? And so we've had some success with that way as well. Is the center up and running or and you're taking patients? The center is up and running and um, the reason we gave out the questionnaire is that although Dr. Popelka has developed a really superb database through which we can really follow everybody. It's not quite yet at the, at the point where we can actually electronically input, input the person. So uh, we also, on both sides, neurology and otolaryngology, lost a key, key people that just meant our provider number was went down. So we are, at the moment, on a fairly low-tech way in that you've got pieces of paper that actually gets sent to Laurie, who's standing in the back there, who's <laughs> manually inputting everything into the database. Um, it's just taking us a little bit of time to get through everyone. And we actually have another neurologist starting in a month or so. And, and all of that takes time to roll out. But we, we hate having to tell people that they have to wait for an appointment. But right now, that is, they're coming through neurology, and that's the that's the avenue, and then they get referred to otolaryngology. But it is actually working, and our next review board's on April the 5th, and we've had some really very, very fascinating discussions with each other about, about people. I just, just for you to know, just to understand, although we have the Stanford Balance Center, we're not all in one place. So you may um, be referred to the Balance Center and uh, be going over f to have the, 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 um, audio, uh, the audiological stuff done in one place. And then you're going to go over to neurology for, your, for that part of things. We are all still talking to each other. We're all still part of each other. I'm going to go nuts with that. Um, but we're not in a physical, we're, we're not physically all in one place. Okay, but the question is about uh, ringing in the ears. Very common problem. And uh, the, the biggest development in the last 10 years is that we really realize that it's beyond the ear that the problem is, um, manifests itself. So something can trigger it from an ear problem, but it's the circuits beyond the ear that often is the, is the cause which is why we've been unable to treat it effectively. Uh, but now there are many new efforts at understanding the brain science. And um, I anticipate that there will be some effective interventions for that uh, in the future. The question is, is, uh, is it related, uh, is the VA involved? The federal government has put a lot more money into our uh, veterans system, including um, the uh, tinnitus, which is what it's called, the ringing. Um, and there are very significant programs now being uh, picked up by the Veterans Administration related to service-related um, problems which end up uh, with ringing. Uh, so there, uh, there's a lot of research activity as well uh, going on. So there's much more going on now than there was uh, even a few years ago.